Welcome to today's show. My name is John. As always, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, formerly known as iTunes, or follow the links to social media in the podcast show notes. So please subscribe when you're finished listening. You can also go to snarkymoviereviews.com to read notes, bios, and other random movie thoughts. Today's movie is National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation 1989. This movie is so funny and accurate I almost can't stand it. This movie was written by John Hughes, but he turned the directing over to Jeremy S. Chekik. We only have a couple of show veterans and a lot of new actors. I'm only going to cover about half the people in this film to keep it from being an hour-long show. Sorry about that. Actors. Right, and I'm a Shakespearean actor. Brian Doyle Murray played the uncaring boss, Frank Shirley. Brian was covered in episode 96, Scrooge 1988. E.G. Marshall played Art, Ellen's father. Marshall was covered in episode 68, The Buccaneer, 1958. Chevy Chase played the role of Clark Griswold. Chase was born in 1943 in New York City. I'm walking here! I'm walking here! Chase graduated from Bard College with a B.A. in English in 1967. Chase worked as a comedian and did some movie work. He also did the usual odd jobs such as cab driver, truck driver, messenger, busboy, and theater usher. Chase met future Saturday Night Live producer Lauren Michaels while waiting in line to see a Monty Python movie. He signed a one-year writer's contract and just became a part of the cast. He was actually the first person to say, Live from New York, it's Saturday night on the show. Chase remained on SNL from its debut to the end of the 1976 season. Chevy Chase is up and down to me when it comes to movies. He made some of the most iconic movies of our generation and some real stinkers. I guess he's edgy. One film of his that I like is Foul Play 1978. He teamed up with Goldie Hawn as a bumbling detective trying to save the Pope while they are being chased by a midget and an albino. Is that the plot of a Dan Brown novel? Burgess Meredith is quite good in his supporting role in this movie. Of course, this was followed by Caddyshack 1980 and Chevy was very good, as was everyone in this amazing movie. Chase teamed with Hawn again as her ex-husband in Seems Like Old Times, 1980. Next, there was Under the Rainbow, 1981, a spy caper set during the filming of The Wizard of Oz, 1939, in a hotel with royals, Nazi assassins, secret agents, tourists, and munchkins from the movie. Then he was in a fun movie, Deal of the Century 1983 with Sigourney Weaver and Gregory Hines. Then it all changed. National Lampoon's Vacation 1983 and its sequels, National Lampoon's European Vacation 1985, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation 1989, Vegas Vacation 1997, and Vacation 2015 came out and a generation of movie watchers had lines they can recite. Next. There are two beloved movies that I don't care for, Fletch 1985 and Fletch Lives 1989. Ackroyd dragged him down in Spies Like Us 1985, but he bounced back with the buddy film Three Amigos 1986. His next good film was Funny Farm 1988. You gotta knock him out. What? Not the only now. way to get the hooks out. Ah. Sorry, Brock, it's your own good. Ah. Oh, yes. Cut that out. Oh, you bastard. It's not working. You're not knocking him out. You're only beating the piss out of him. You bitches. Hold still. You're as tough. Ah, He's get else away. Get I away. only hooked him in the neck. I'm not trying get to away. kill him. This was followed by a series of duds. I'll reach back and grab Modern Problems 1981 and add it to Caddyshack 2 1988, Memoirs of an Invisible Man 1992, Cops and Robertsons 1994, Man of the House 1995, and Snow Day 2000. But Chase popped back with the major television hit Community 2009 to 2014. He has been in some better movies as well, such as Hot Tub Time Machine 2010, Hot Tub Time Machine 2 2015, and the previously mentioned Vacation 2015. Chase is still active. Beverly D'Angelo was Ellen Griswold. She was born in Ohio in 1951. Beverly was trained in art and started as an artist for Hanna-Barbera Productions. She left that job to pursue a rock and roll career in Canada. Eventually, she ended up in a rock version of Hamlet. 
She went to Broadway with a souped-up version of the play. The play didn't run long, but it lasted long enough for Beverly to get noticed by Hollywood. Beverly started with small roles in films like Annie Hall, 1977, and The Sentinel, 1977. She received a bit of attention for the Clint Eastwood, Ape Fest, Every Which Way But Loose, 1978. Then there was a movie version of the Broadway musical Hair, 1979, and the Loretta Lynn biopic, Coal Miner's Daughter, 1980, both of which allowed her to highlight her considerable vocal talent. Beverly had a long string of comedies, including Paternity, 1981, with former Florida State football player Burt Reynolds. Of course, this was followed by National Lampoon Vacation, 1983, National Lampoon's European Vacation, 1985, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, 1989, Pterodactyl Woman from Beverly Hills, 1997, which I must admit I haven't seen yet, and Vegas Vacation, 1997. Beverly was amazing in American History X, 1998, as a single mother caught between the racism of her son and her Jewish boyfriend played by Elliot Gould. She showed up on the HBO series Entourage, 2005-2011, as a hard-as-nails agent, Barbara Miller. Finally, she reprised her Griswold role in Vacation 2015. Beverly is working on television and still making movies. Randy Quaid played cousin Eddie Johnson. Quaid was born in Texas in 1950. He became interested in acting in high school. He began studying acting at the University of Houston. One of his teachers sent him to audition for Peter Bogdanovich. This led to him being cast in The Last Picture Show, 1971. He had small parts in films like What's Up, Doc, 1972, Paper Moon, 1973, and Lolly Madonna XXX, 1973 until he was cast in The Last Detail, 1973, where Quaid won the Best Actor in a Supporting Role Oscar to go with Jack Nicholson's Best Actor Oscar. In the late 1970s, he continued to make movies such as the Woody Guthrie biopic Bound for Glory, 1976, Western film The Missouri Breaks, 1976, police buddy film The Choir Boys, 1977, and a very credible American prisoner in a Turkish jail, in Midnight Express, 1978. Another interesting movie was The Long Riders, 1980. The film had four sets of real brothers playing outlaw brothers. They were David Carradine as Cole Younger, Keith Carradine as Jim Younger, Robert Carradine as Bob Younger, James Keach as Jesse James, Stacy Keach as Frank James, Christopher Guest as Charlie Ford, Nicholas Guest, who plays Todd in today's movie, as Bob Ford, Dennis Quaid as Ed Miller, and Randy Quaid as Clell Miller. Harry Carey Jr. is in the film as well to give real cowboy cred. Of course, the first three actors mentioned are the children of John Carradine. Quaid really hit the big time playing Cousin Eddie in National Lampoon's Vacation 1983, National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation 1989, and Vegas Vacation 1997. Some of his great roles include Caddyshack 2 1988, Days of Thunder, 1990, Bye Bye Love, 1995, where he and Janine Garofalo hammed it up, Kingpin, 1996, Independence Day, 1996, where he was fantastic, and Brokeback Mountain, 2005. Although he's had some legal troubles, he continues to work. Now, I've got a few other actors that I'm not going to talk about because this would go on forever. Juliette Lewis played Audrey. John Galecki played Rusty. John Randolph was Clark Sr. Diane Ladd was Nora. Doris Roberts was Francis. William Hickey was Lewis. Nicholas Guest was Todd. Julia Louise Dreyfus was Margot. And Mae Questel played Aunt Bethany. She was also the voice of Betty Boop in the 1930s. Story. Let me explain. No, there is too much. Let me sum up. The credits roll with an animated Santa trying to deliver toys to the Griswold family and having a hard time doing so. Clark, Chevy Chase, and Ellen, Beverly D'Angelo, are singing Christmas carols in the front seat of the car, while Rusty, Johnny Galecki, and Audrey, Juliette Lewis, are making death faces in the back. They are trying to find a Christmas tree. Clark gets into a road rage incident with a truck full of rednecks. It ends with the Griswold car driving under a log truck. 
Clark pulls out and is launched off a snowbank. Instead of buying a tree at a lot, the family hikes through the snow to find the perfect Christmas tree in the wild. Finally, Clark sees the perfect Christmas tree bathed in golden light. Of course, Clark has forgotten to bring a saw. At last, they have the giant tree attached to their car and are heading home. Back in Chicago, the giant tree is laying in the front yard. Yuppie neighbors Todd, Nicholas Guest, and Margot, Julie Louise Dreyfus, ask about the size of the tree, and Clark tells them he can stick it up their butts. Once the tree is stuffed into the house, Ellen doesn't believe they can get a star on the top because it's crammed against the ceiling. When Clark cuts the rope of the tree, it explodes, breaking a couple of windows. In bed that night, he still has sap on his hands. Ellen tells Clark that her family is coming. Clark is calm. Clark is at work, and the talk turns to the expected Christmas bonus. He plans on having a pool installed in the backyard. The president of the company, Frank Shirley, Brian Doyle Murray, comes by and doesn't even know Clark's name. Bastard. Mark? Hmm. Clark. Are you the one who was working on that non-nutritive cereal varnish? Yes, sir. I've got to give a speech to a trade group. I'd like to mention it. Write up a brief summary and have it to me by the end of the day. My pleasure. Layman's terms, none of that inside bullshit jargon that nobody understands. Yes, sir. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Kiss my ass. Kiss his ass. Kiss your ass. Happy Hanukkah. Later, the Griswold family is downtown shopping at a department store. Clark is overcome by the lingerie sales lady. He shamelessly starts hitting on her. Can I show you something? I was just browse, browsing. <laughs> For your wife or your girlfriend? Wouldn't be the Christmas shopping season if the stores were any less hooter than they are. Harder than they are. It's a bit nipply out. I mean nippy out. <laughs> what did I say? Nipple? <laughs> Uh, there is a nip in the air, though. Can I take something out for you? I was just looking at something for my wife. God rest her soul. Oh, God, I'm so sorry. Oh, no, no, she's not dead. <laughs> We're just divorced. She's history. <laughs> and obviously she doesn't wear underwear. And <laughs> There are plenty of shopping days left until adulteries, adulthood. Tis the season to be married. Well, that's my name. No oh, shit and his son Rusty bust him. With It's a Wonderful Life 1946 playing on TV, Ellen and Clark's parents arrive, and they are fighting before they get inside. Clark Sr., John Rudolph, Nora, Diane Ladd, are clearly Clark's parents, and Francis, Doris Roberts, and Art, E.G. Marshall, are Elaine's parents. Lots of awkward hugs, presents, and family drama. Clark and Rusty escape the drama by putting up lights outside. Todd and Margot hope for Clark's death as he climbs a giant ladder. This has to be a plot concocted by wives. Send your husband out in the coldest, wettest, iciest part of the year to climb on a ladder? I wonder what the annual number of husbands that buy the farm between Thanksgiving and Christmas putting up lights is. I guess you could just do what they do in Brownsville, Texas and just leave the lights hanging all year. As the fathers sleep in front of the TV, Clark adds lights to the house until eventually he falls. Audrey is throwing a fit because she has to share a bed with her brother so the grandparents can stay in the house. Would it be indecent to ask the grandparents to stay at a hotel? Audrey. We're all making sacrifices, Audrey. Everybody, do you sleep with your brother? Do you know how sick and twisted that is, Mom? Well, I'm sleeping with your father. Don't be so dramatic. <laughs> I have nightmares about what he does in his bed alone when I'm not lying right next to him. Well, I, I don't know what to say, except it's Christmas and we're all in misery. Clark continues to work on the roof as night falls. Eventually he falls too, but not before launching a giant icicle through Todd and Margot's window, killing the stereo. Clark drags the extended family into the yard to turn on the lights. After a drum roll... Drum roll, please. Drum roll. Oh. Oh, uh... The lights fail to come on. Mother-in-law Francis shames Clark in front of his family. Clark works through the night looking for the cause of the light failure. The next day, Clark climbs into the attic to hide a present. 
Francis shuts the ladder trapping Clark. Everyone else leaves the house. Clark spends the day trying to stay warm and going slowly crazy. He gets misty watching old family movies. Finally, the family returns and Ellen finds Clark. That night, Clark keeps working on the lights. Ellen asks if the cords are plugged in, as only a wife can do. In the house, Nora flips the switch and the lights come on. Margot and Todd are blinded as the city blacks out and the nuclear power plant goes into heavy production. Nora turns the switch off, leaving the mystery intact. Ellen finally lets Clark have his glory by turning on the switch. Arthur. Art. Dad. Thanks for being here. The little lights are not twinkling. I know, Art, and thanks for noticing. In all the glory of the light, Clark is shocked when Ellen's cousin, Eddie, Randy Quaid, wife Catherine, Miriam Flynn, two kids, and a Rottweiler named Snots show up in a dilapidated RV. Yeah, if you don't remember, this here is Rocky. <laughs> Have you got a kiss for me? Eh, you better take a rain check on that, Art. He's got a lip fungus he ain't identified yet. You remember Ruby Sue. And this here's our pride and joy, Snots. Pretty name, Ed. Yeah, we named him that because he's got the sinus condition. <laughs> Snots, you roll over and let Uncle Clark scratch your belly. You ain't never seen a set on a dog like this one, Scott Clark. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, Eddie. <laughs> That's something, ain't it? You pet him, Clark, on the belly, and he'll love you till the day you die. Later, Clark catches Snots drinking the Christmas tree water. He thinks it will dry the tree out, but Eddie is not concerned. If he drinks the water out of there, the tree's gonna dry up. Come on, out of there. Snot! Out, out, out! He's cute, ain't he? Only problem is he's got a little bit of Mississippi leg hound in him. If the mood catches him right, he'll grab your leg and just go to town. <laughs> you don't want him around if you wear his short pants, if you know what I mean. <laughs> A word of warning, though, if he does lay in to you, it's best to just let him finish. They are drinking eggnog out of Wally World Cups. Clark drops off a present for Mr. Shirley. He is really mean. Now, as you know from the first vacation film, Clark makes a living developing chemical additives. When the family decides to go sledding, he coats the bottom of his with a special Teflon-type spray. Clark picks up so much speed that the bottom of his sled catches on fire as he sails off into the distance. Eddie doesn't want to go too fast because the Veteran Administration replaced the metal plate in his head with a plastic one. You know that metal plate in my head? Ah, how can I forget? I had to have it replaced because every time Catherine revved up the microwave, I'd piss my pants and forget who I was for a half hour or so. So over at the VA, they had to replace it with a plastic one, and it ain't as strong, so... <laughs> I don't know if I ought to go sailing down no hill with nothing between the ground and my brain but a piece of government plastic. Clark is at work thinking about his pool. Clark tells his friend that it is his last day before the holidays. Clark asks about the bonus checks, and his friend thinks he has gotten his, but Clark has not. Similar to the first vacation film, Clark has a sexual daydream. He is staring out the window to where his pool is to be built, and the girl from the department store comes and does a strip tease. It seems Fast Times at Ridgemont High in 1982 clipped a little from this movie. His daydream is interrupted by Eddie's daughter because she thinks he is Santa Claus. She and her brother are worried that Santa is not coming this year because he didn't come last year. He tells her that Santa is definitely coming to see them. It's a madhouse in the morning as the families fight. Clark sees Eddie in a mini robe draining the toilet of the RV into the sewer drain. What are you looking at? Oh, the silent majesty of a winter's morn, the clean, cool chill of the holiday air, and an asshole in his bathrobe emptying a chemical toilet into my sewer. Shitter was full! Eddie calmly says, Shitter's full. Clark tells Ellen that it's a storm sewer and that anyone that lights a match by it may be sorry. Todd is horrified by the smell in the act. Clark and Eddie go shopping and Eddie lets on that he is broke and has lost the house and now lives in the RV. They sent all their money to a TV preacher that was screwing a hockey player. Eddie loads the cart with food for snots. Clark says that he and Ellen will give the kids a good Christmas. On Christmas Eve, Aunt Bethany, Mae Questel, 
and Uncle Lewis, William Hickey, show up. Bethany is senile. Rusty brings one of Bethany and Lewis's presents back, and apparently she has packed the cat. Mom? What? This box is meowing. Let me see it. They prepare a nice dinner for everyone. They ask Bethany to say the blessing. Grace! Grace! She passed away 30 years ago. They want you to say Grace. She gets confused and recites the Pledge of Allegiance. Eddie stands and puts his hand over his heart because he is a good U.S. veteran. Clark cuts the turkey and it's a dried hulk. Catherine starts crying, saying she knew she put it in too early. The family eats the crackling turkey. Kind of reminds me of the pork skin cracklings my mother would make. Tasty as hell, but you could break a tooth. I'm pretty sure they were cholesterol free. Snot throws up under the table, having already eaten a bag of trash. Bethany's cat starts chewing on the Christmas tree wires. When Clark plugs in the tree, the cat is electrocuted. After dinner, Lewis lights a cigar and the tree is burned to a crisp, and he's on fire as well. Clark is mad and the delivery man comes to the door with a coveted Christmas bonus. When Clark opens the envelope, it is a one-year membership to the Jelly of the Month Club. Clark says he wants his boss brought over wrapped in a bow so he can tell him off to his face. He then goes ape shit. If any of you are looking for any last-minute gift ideas for me, I have one. I like Frank Shirley, my boss, right here tonight. I want him brought from his happy holiday slumber over there on Melody Lane with all the other rich people. And I want him brought right here with a big ribbon on his head. And I want to look him straight in the eye and I want to tell him what a cheap, lying, no good, rotten, four flushing, low life, snake licking, dirt eating, inbred, overstuffed, ignorant, blood sucking, dog kissing, brainless, dickless, hopeless, heartless, fat ass, bug eyed, stiff legged, spotty lip, worm headed sack of monkey shit he is. Hallelujah! Holy shit! Where's the Tylenol? Eddie heads out in the RV and Clark gets his chainsaw out. He cuts a tree in his yard and it crashes through Todd and Margot's window. Later, Clark dresses as Santa. He uses the chainsaw to fix a loose stair post in the house before going downstairs to put presents under the tree. Bethany hears a squeaking sound. Clark looks into the tree and a squirrel jumps out. They all treat the squirrel like it's a wolverine. Finally, Snots gets after it and destroys the house in the process. Margot goes over to stand up to Clark. When the door is open, she is attacked by the squirrel and then the dog. When she goes home, she hits Todd right in the face. When the visitors try and leave, Clark makes them stay for an old-fashioned Christmas. Eddie's RV is seen driving away from a mansion. Clark Sr. calms his son down and the entire group settles down for the reading of Twas the night before Christmas. Eddie's RV pulls into the driveway. Clark sees Eddie coming with Mr. Shirley tied and chained, wearing a large red bow. Mission oriented. Hoo-ha! Back at the mansion, Mr. Shirley's wife calls the police. Clark releases his boss. The boss fires him and tells Eddie he is going to jail. Seeing the faces, Mr. Shirley has a change of heart. He says Clark will have a 20% increase over last year's bonus. The police surround the house as happiness ensues inside. SWAT teams come down the roof and break into Margot and Todd's house for better shooting positions. Then they crash through the windows and doors of the Griswold house. The police bring in Mrs. Shirley. When she finds out about the bonus cut, she calls her husband low. The police officer says he would beat him with a rubber hose if he had one. Mr. Shirley says he has changed his mind. Eddie and Catherine's children see a light in the sky and run out to look for Santa. The entire group goes into the front yard and Clark shows them the Christmas star. Lewis says it's a light on the sewer treatment plant just before he throws a match into the sewer drain. That ain't the friggin' Christmas star, Grizz. It's a light on the sewage treatment plant. Sewer gas. Don't drop that! The drain explodes, knocking everybody down and sending the plastic Santa and reindeer team flying through the sky like a comet. Bethany thinks it's the 4th of July and sings the national anthem. 
The police and SWAT join in. Eddie salutes because he's a veteran. Clark looks up and says, I did it. World famous short summary. Chicago police use excessive force. See also the Blues Brothers 1980. I hope you enjoyed today's show. I really appreciate you spending the time listening. You can find connections to social media and email on my site at snarkymoviereviews.com. There are links in the podcast show notes as well. Remember, the show is completely free and independent. All that I ask is that you jump over to Apple Podcasts and give me a review. It really helps the show get found. Beware the moors.